this evening. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Margaret, and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening on the third installment of the webinar series, Historical Artifact Identification. As I noted in the last webinar, ceramics, bottles and glass and cans are arguably the most common artifacts identified on historical sites. This evening, we'll be summarizing a variety of artifact types that are commonly found on domestic sites, as well as on trash scatters and dumps, tools, hardware, tech, and personal items. This discussion underscores the influence of America's post-reconstruction industrial growth here in the American Southwest. Transportation, in particular the railroad, changed how small rural homesteaders and city dwellers received their goods. New technology, especially advancements in the steel industry, revolutionized production of metal goods like tools and hardware. Developments of machines, both small and large, ushered in an era of mass production of all goods. All of this at a time when the American West was experiencing significant growth. Before the end of the 19th century, rural farmers and ranchers were special ordering goods from department and trade catalogs. Traditional tools were better refined and hardware was manufactured in mass. People of even simple means could afford an entire slew of personal items like clothing, shoes, toys, many of which were made from a wide variety of materials. The items discussed this evening, all of which have been manufactured for a century and more, have not changed appreciably to this day. Consequently, they're often overlooked when recording sites. Importantly, they do not always exhibit temporally diagnostic attributes for dating sites. Hardware, for instance. They grace many a homeowner's garage and tool shed. If any of you are like me, you have decades and decades of loose hardware like nails, screws, washers and bolts and old coffee cans and baby bottles. I'm sure by this time, much of it is historical in age, to be technical, and we'll probably keep these hardware items in our sheds forever, waiting for that one emergency that never seems to come. Other items like buttons, coins, tokens, marbles, dolls, and toys have been a part of our lives since the colonial era. Well, it's more accurate to say they've been with us for centuries and even millennia. But of course, we have to limit this webinar series to the late historic period following the American Civil War. While these items do not always give us what we need regarding a temporal range of occupation or use of a site, they do give us important clues about site function, as well as clues to those other important questions, who, what, and why. Unfortunately, given our time constraints, I can only gloss over these artifact types tonight. For those of you that are itching for more, there is a wealth of materials to help us understand just how these artifact types influenced our lives historically and continue to do so today. Information on the internet in just the last 10 years enables us to acquire so many important scanned and electronic resources, including field guides, old company catalogs, and of course, copies of the sales catalogs like Sears, Roebuck and Company, and Montgomery Ward. I know I've promised you all the table of manufacturers from last month's webinar and ammunition. I've been extremely busy and I apologize for that, um, but I intend to get you all uh, an updated table of manufacturers in the next month or so, since I have a, a leave of several months now. And I'm guessing after tonight's discussion, I'll probably have to provide additional links uh, to the existing material culture resource document that is available for you to download on the uh, APF website, the Arizona Preservation Foundation website. One benefit of this series, for me at least, is that I have found so many additional great resources in just the last few months of preparing for these webinar series that I might otherwise never have discovered or might not have discovered for many years to come. So let's discuss tonight. Uh, let's start with uh, tools and hardware. This first installment is a short presentation on tools, hardware, and tech related items. Many thanks to Homer Teal of Desert Archaeology for assisting with the development of this module. Forgive me if you already know this, but tack is a reference to all things related to horses. I'm sure an experienced equestrian would have a more restrictive understanding of tack than I do, 
but I tend to include horseshoes and horse nails with tech, as well as hardware and goods associated with other pastoral animals like yokes and harnesses. Identifying tools on archeological sites may assist in determining the site's function, not to mention the occupations of the site's residents. Tools themselves are not as common on sites as other artifacts, however, given their long shelf life and durability, not to mention their value to their owners. In the same way that many of us hoard hardware, we also hoard tools. We just can't let them go. Tools may be more common on industrial sites, but these types of sites are, often record, are not often recorded on class three surveys. They typically occur in urban settings. Tools were advertised and sold a century ago based on targeted professions. Carpenters, millers, plumbers, electricians, bricklayers, pipe layers, miners, farmers, you name it. Today, they're not necessarily sold in that manner, although certain tools are still preferred by their uh, respective professions. We all own a variety of tools that can be used in any manner like axes, hammers, screwdrivers, pliers, and wrenches. Nonetheless, for the purposes of this evening, uh, I think it helps to organize them under these categories as they might help us with the interpretation of site function when we're documenting a, an archeological site. We'll go through each of these categories along with the common hardware that was used by artisans in these various trades. Carpentry tools are perhaps the most common tool identified on domestic sites as they were used on all aspects of maintenance of a home, farm, and ranch. Hammers, saws, planes, chisels, screwdrivers, and wrenches were essential tools for the carpenter, as were any number of additional tools as depicted in this advertisement. These tools, as I've noted, have changed very little since the late 19th century. While carpenters were undoubtedly in demand for small towns for the 19th century, Homesteaders had to be skilled in carpentry as well, considering it was they who built their own homes and their barns and other outbuildings on their properties. The late historic period through the 1930s was the era of homesteading, after all. Every homesteader had, at least, had to have at least the necessary skills to construct a livable home. I'm sure we all know of many carpenters who were absolute superstars in their trade. One other essential tool that was used by carpenters was indeed used in a wide variety of trades, the ax. Historically, this was the primary tool for felling trees, dressing logs, fine tuning, fine -tuning milled lumber, and for sport. At one point in the early 20th century, companies advertised up to 30 different types of ax head shapes, as well as various styles of hatchets as shown here. By the 1950s, large industrial saws were replacing axes for felling trees. And of course the chainsaw in the 1960s changed everything. I'm sure you can special order to axes today if desired, but most axes and hatchets sold in hardware stores are sold in only a variety of shapes and sizes. This nice gentleman here is using a fireman's ax, presumably to rescue his damsel in distress. Blacksmithing tools also comprise a, a variety, a wide variety that were used to manufacture specialized items made of metal, ranging from wagon axles, metal barrel hoops, and home hardware like hinges. Technically, Blacksmiths did not specialize in making horseshoes, but they often partnered with farriers or filled in as farriers as well. Tools used by blacksmiths would include the anvil, of course, a wide variety of tongs and hammers, wrenches, drill presses, and screw plates. Some sites were also show evidence of blacksmithing by the presence of a metal slag or iron bar fragments and discard in horseshoes of, uh, of various conditions. Of course, where one finds evidence of blacksmithing, they may also find evidence of a stable with tools like pitchforks, curry combs, shovels, 
in that related matter. TAC related items we'd expect to find on these types of sites would include leather, fragments of harnesses, saddles, and miscellaneous hardware, like buckles and bits. Even cattle related items will be present. Uh, they're actually quite similar, but who knows? Granted, when recording a site that has been impacted by decades of erosion and the elements, much of these materials will probably be unrecognizable, especially the leather fragments. We can only do so much when recording a site. But one artifact type that is always recognizable is the horseshoe, which comes in a variety of sizes, depending on, of course, the size of the horse. As shown here, mule and ox shoes are somewhat different as well. Shoes were attached to the animal with a very distinctive type of nail. Oops. These are horseshoe nails. It's good to keep an eye out for these type of, of nails when you're recording uh, any kind of domestic or, or farm or rural site that does have horseshoes and similar materials. Agricultural tools found on small farms and ranches would include rakes, shovels, hoes, varieties of plows, scythes, and more. Or maybe it's scythe. We'll have to figure that one out. As you can imagine, farmers and ranchers by necessity owned a wide variety of different tools to conduct various activities on their homesteads. Wagons were the primary transportation vehicle prior to the automobile. Common tools affiliated with wagon maintenance and repair included malleable wrenches, a, AKA buggy wrenches, as well as circular wheel rights, which measured the diameter of the wheels. The large iron, iron tool on the lower uh, left here of the slide is a wheel lug wrench. Various hardware components are also shown. Just a bit of useless trivia. Linda Ronstadt's family owned a wagon shop in Tucson for many years, known as the F. Ronstadt Company. Now you know the rest of the story. Let's discuss quickly the types of hardware we might find with the various professions and industries we uh, just ran through. Perhaps the most ubiquitous hardware type is the nail. Historically, nails were handmade by special craftsmen and blacksmiths. But in the early 19th century, machines were developed for making nails in greater quantities. By the time of the American Civil War, machine cut nails, as shown here, were made in great quantities. Today, we call these machine cut nails square nails or concrete nails. That's right, they are still made today. Clinch nails, as shown on the right here, were also made by machine but were much more malleable so that they can be bent over and hammered into the wood for greater security. The modern wire nail, appropriately known as common nails, were developed after 1850 and were in use across the country by the early 20th century as a result of industrialization and mass production. Consequently, most nails encountered here in Arizona are likely to be the wire nails. Common nails come in a variety of sizes as shown, but wire nails aren't just known as common nails. There are other terms that are commonly used like brad nails, flooring nails, box nails, finishing nails, roofing nails, and U-nails to name a few. Historically, U-nails were just simply known as fence nails because that was their primary purpose. The presence of these variety types may, insist in, may assist in site interpretations. Moreover, concentrations of nails in specific areas of a recorded site may indicate a structure was present at that location. By themselves, wire nails do not provide uh, too much information in terms of temporal use of a site, but they can, they can assist with site function and can help us interpret what kind of activities were taking place on a site. 
Of course, as with anything made from metal, nails are more likely to be rusted, fragmented, and even unrecognizable by the time we record them on sites. But there are always a few that get preserved somehow and might be measurable if need be. Screws, bolts, and nuts are also common on late historical sites. Like nails, this type of hardware has been in use from the late 19th century. In 1864, Mr. William Sellers developed a standard thread measurement for screws, bolts, and nuts. Prior to this time, there had been no standard, and replacing this hardware was very difficult, considering the threads were handmade and could not be duplicated. Excuse me. <coughs> As I mentioned before, blacksmiths, they also specialized in making these types of threaded screws, although, of course, there were no standards at the time. However, with the universal standard that Mr. Sellers developed, machines were, were made for mass production and screws were designed for all uses, including carpentry, electrical use, and machine. Sellers' ideas also influenced standards for bolts and nuts, which were likewise mass produced from the late 19th century. Oops, excuse me. As with nails, the variety and sizes and shapes of this hardware type may help with the interpretation of a documented site. Now, as you can see for many years, slotted heads were the only type made for screws and bolts, but we'll discuss shortly how the 20th century introduced two additional screw heads that can help us in dating some sites. Needless to say, screws and bolts are now an essential part of our hardware universe and sold in any variety of sizes, shapes, and styles. Henry Ford started his company in 1908, offering his Model T in any color imaginable, so long as it was black. In the tragic years of the 1920s, leading up to the Great, Depressions, the Great Depression, many families in the Dust Belt in the Midwest and the South had no choice but to choose cars over homes and heirlooms. Tools affiliated with automobiles are quite varied and include multiple wrench types, including combination wrenches, adjustable wrenches, and socket wrenches. Again, many of these tools were available prior to the automobile, but they were fine-tuned as the assembly line and automation took precedence over individual skill in the 20th century. The crescent wrench, or the adjustable wrench, for example, on the right, right corner of the slide is a 20th century development having been invented in the first decade of the new century. Screwdrivers, of course, were important for attaching clamps onto hoses and all kinds of additional uses, but using the slotted head screws was a real problem for assembly lines, considering these heads could strip easily and considering that automated machines had issues trying to zero in on these types of screws. In 1909, the Robertson head was invented in Canada. While it was not designed for use in automobile factories, it quickly became the screw of choice in Canada. Unfortunately, according to various stories, Mr. Robertson was not a fan of Henry Ford and refused to sell these screws to him in America. Consequently, Ford trudged on with slotted heads until the Phillips head was invented in the early 1930s. The patent for the uh, Phillips head, as you can see, was 1936. Before the end of the decade, the Phillips head was clearly the winner in the United States. Square head screws are common enough here in the US. That's what we call the Robertson ones, at least that's what I call them. But the Phillips heads are still the favorite here in America. Now you know, again, the rest of the story. Other hardware components of automobiles observed on sites will include hubcaps, door handles, and engine components like oil filters and spark plugs. One thing I've learned on my job is to find experts in a variety of industries and professional fields that I can rely on for information when I need it. My father-in-law, as part of the greatest generation, is a self-taught expert in automotive maintenance and, and mechanics. He's been building cars, after all, since he was in high school. 
On the few occasions when I do document or record hubcaps, small parts of cars, spark plugs, etc., I always give him a call and ask him to help with interpretation of dates, if he can do so. More often than not, he's able to, to give me something that's really great to use and useful. I can take a photograph of a hubcap, for instance, and he'll be able to tell me the make, model, and year of the vehicle that the hubcap was made for. We all need experts like this. Sites affiliated with railroads, including the track lines themselves, not to mention abandoned stations, water towers, and maintenance yards might exhibit a variety of tools like alligator wrenches, lanterns, crowbars, drills, and much more. Alligator wrenches are rarely used today, but were apparently used on railroad lines and engines where a good grip was required on a metal pipe or a tube. Those have been replaced, of course, by plunky wrenches and other combination and adjustable wrenches. Documentation of railroads, whether abandoned or in use, should include an inventory of lesser components observed on the track system, including spikes, tie plates, and anchors, all of which may have been made with maker marks and even dates of manufacture on the plates themselves. It's also important to carefully write down information on the steel rails as shown in the table here. This information tells you when the rail was made down to the month, as well as the company and even how it was made. The first column or the first row, for instance, the rail was made by the Carnegie Steel Company, um, rolled in November, 1895. The months are indicated by the ones. In the second row, the OH is a reference to the method of steel production, which was open hearth. At the time, it was a more economical process of making these rails. Now, it's important to remember that railroads were maintained over the course of years, decades, and in the case of some of our railroads, over a century. Consequently, the dates that are shown or observed on the rails when you're recording them they may not tell you exactly when the railroad was constructed, but they do give you an indication of how often they were upgraded. Mining sites included tools like picks, shovels, hammers, drills, steel bits, pinch bars, etc. Some mining related sites did not actually do the digging, but they tested ore samples from nearby mines for mineral value. On these types of sites, cupels, crucibles, and scorifiers are common accessories for the labs that were on these sites. They were known as assay labs. Rock samples were taken to these assay labs containing precious metals, and they were measured for value. The rock samples were pulverized in a lab, mixed with chemicals known as fluxes. This mixture was poured into crucibles or scorifiers and then fired in an oven. The molten mixture was poured into molds and allowed to cool to a solid form. After breaking open the solid mixture, the worthless slag was separated from the valuable metal, which was usually gold, silver, or even lead. In this, in this way, they could measure and get an indication for how rich the ore was uh, that was coming from a specific mine. In addition to these small cup artifacts, the say sites will have a sizable sample of slag across the surface of, a, of the site itself. It's fortunate that these artifact types often include uh, company marks, as you can see on a couple of these. So be sure to look on the basis of cupels, crucifiers, and scor scorifiers if you encounter these on any site. I should probably add that you should be looking like at this kind of information on every artifact that you find for manufacturer marks. Anything that might be, you might be able to look up. Before we dive into other artifact types, I think it's I think it's appropriate to conclude our discussion on tools and hardware with wire and fencing. Wire, you ask, why would we worry about wire? 
Well, in my experience at least, next to nails in small hardware, wire is one of the most common hardware types identified on late historic period sites here in Arizona. Wire was ordered in bundles and used for a variety of purposes on a rural homestead. Baling hay, hanging items, clothes lines, indoor furnishings, and of course, when electri le electricity was available, we see a lot of electrical copper wire. Then of course, there was fencing. Chicken and poultry wire, garden wire, hog wire are common wire types used on fences. Of course, I'd be remiss in not mentioning barbed wire, the culprit, if you will, in many a Western tale, pitting the homesteaders and the townsfolk against the free grazing ranchers driving their cattle across the open plains. Yes, I'm a big fan of Westerns and open range was one of my favorite Westerns. In the post-Civil War era, an estimated 200 patents were approved for barbed wire, mainly in the Midwest, as well as in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. We aren't likely to find these specialty barbed wire types here in Arizona, however, because these were handmade and not sold in great quantities. It wasn't until 1873 that a farmer named Joseph Glidden filed for a patent of his twisted strand barbed wire. This wire, which could be made in large quantities and mass produced, was an immediate success. And within a decade, the Great Plains had been fenced and Arizona was on its way as homesteaders moved out to fence their claims. Very little has changed by way of its design although wire today in all forms is now made with alloys that considerably slows down the rusting process of barbed wire. Now throughout this discussion this evening on tools and hardware, I've shown you a lot of ads and photographs or pictures from a variety of trade catalogs, mainly from Sears Roebuck and Company. There were other types of tools and hardware that we didn't get a chance to discuss hardware affiliated with shoemakers, those in the millinery, millinery industry making dresses and such, undertakers, and stonemasons. Uh, I ask your forgiveness for that, but uh, the internet has a great variety of resources for learning more about these other trades and for the trades that we discussed this evening, reproduction catalogs that we can find online or that we can probably buy as well. Modern catalogs, which can be downloaded. And then, of course, collector guides, which come in a wide variety, from a wide variety of collectors. Let's uh, turn our discussion now to personal items. This discussion includes artifacts that are classified as personal such as coins, tokens and keys, hygiene products, clothing, printed material items, toys and household items, as well as glass beads. Now, of course, we'll only be able to discuss a few of these this evening. Each item listed on this slide necessitates some degree of familiarity by historical archeologists. Early catalogs from large retailers like Sears, Roebuck and Company, Montgomery Ward, offer great information on what was advertised in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. Unfortunately, of course, again, given the limited time we have, we can only go through some of the more common ones that uh, in my experience that I've identified on historical sites. Buttons were made in America in the colonial period with limited materials like wood, pewter, ivory, silver, and brass. Paul Revere was one of the entrepreneurs in the colonial era making silver buttons in the Revolutionary War period. The Waterbury Button Company was one of the few companies making buttons in 1810, and they continue to produce buttons today, specializing in military and high-priced consumer buttons. On the eve of the American Civil War, a number of other materials were being used to make buttons, including porcelain, bone, horn, and shell. 
By 1890, freshwater shell buttons had become a national phenomenon as businessmen harvested mollusks along the banks of the Mississippi River in the Midwestern states. This table presented here, I, uh, I got these numbers from the 1900 census report on the button industry in the United States. Just an FYI for, uh, for you researchers out there, every decade, the census had special reports for specific manufacturing industries. Not all, not all the same industries, of course, every decade, but they chose specific ones. And in 1900, they actually had a special report on buttons. The numbers displayed here are in gross, which is considered a large dozen or a dozen dozen, which is 144 basically. Of an estimated 3 billion buttons made in 1900, 40% were made from shell, whether freshwater shell in the American Midwest or ocean shell, most of which, uh, most of which was imported from Europe and Asia and made into buttons here in America. Other common material types as shown in this table were brass, vegetable ivory, and composition materials. Vegetable ivory, by the way, is essentially a nut that closely resembles real animal ivory. Common button materials observed on sites here in Arizona will include the ones that are pictured here on the slide. Shell, of course, is very common, as are the porcelain buttons, which are known by collectors uh, as Prosser buttons. Prosser was the name of the gentleman who invented the process of making porcelain buttons in the 1830s. Prosser buttons, at first look, appear to be glass. They're nice and glossy on the uh, front part. But when you flip the button over, you'll notice a very rough texture that many compare, compare to an orange peel. This rough texture on the back is not present on glass buttons. The uh, glass buttons are actually smooth all the way around. So if you can feel or you can notice the rough texture on the back of a what appears to be a glass button, it's actually a Prosser button. Steel buttons are also common, though admittedly are not in the greatest condition on the ground surface of sites, as we've talked about with the hardware. In the late 19th century, Levi Strauss developed hardy clothes for mining workers and Levi buttons and rivets appeared across the West. In the 1930s, snapper buttons were also quite the fad and quite popular. These buttons, the snapper buttons, were sold in bulk to, uh, to homeowners who can then incorporate these buttons into making any type of shirt for their children or their husbands or their wives. <laughs> it's worth noting that the materials listed in this table became, for the most part, obsolete by about 1930 when plastic buttons were made in mass. Now, before we leave this table, you'll notice celluloid buttons near the bottom of the table here. Celluloid was actually one of the first plastics made in this country. From its inception in the mid to late 1800s, plastic became increasingly popular in a variety of products, including buttons. Celluloid itself is a composite material made from synthetic plastic as well as um, organic fibers like cotton. But as you can see in this case, in 1900, the numbers don't lie on this table. Shell was a, clearly the preferred button uh, up until about 1930. Various plastics were used for producing buttons in the late historic period, that is the 20th century, which included celluloid that we just discussed, as well as bakelite and lucite. Celluloid being the oldest, as I just mentioned, was not fully synthetic. But bakelite is considered the first fully synthetic plastic. It was patented around 1907, used for about 17 years or so until the patent ran out. 
and then it was produced as a generic type of plastic through the 1950s. Finally, Lucite was introduced in the late 1930s by DuPont and became very popular as button material through the 1960s. Now, collectors claim that one can tell the difference between these plastic materials by rinsing them in hot water and smelling them. Apparently, each one gives off a very specific scent. Each, apparently, <laughs> We, we don't really want to do that when we're recording sites because that's kind of disgusting, you know. Now, maybe if you're collecting buttons and you wash them, then you can rinse them in hot water and do the smell test. The best we can hope for is to narrow the temporal range when we're recording a site by incorporating all of the other artifacts that we've documented and then making a educated guess based on the time period or the occupation of that site as to what kind of plastic was likely used on the buttons that we observed. Even that can sometimes be problematic when you consider how popular plastic was as a material in the 20th century, used for any product that you can imagine, from small appliances to toys, jewelry, and other knickknacks. Let's go back to buttons. Buttons are typically made in one piece as depicted by 1A and 1B here on the uh, figure. However, two-piece buttons were common enough made with a front and a back as shown in uh, the Roman numeral number two. Finally, uh, a more formal button was known as the three-piece. The three-piece button is essentially a two-piece button, but there is a separate metal band along the perimeter of the junction of those two of the front and the back, which forms the third piece of the button. Button backs may include a wide variety of shanks, like those shown on the left, or they may be defined as studs, like cufflinks that we find on tuxedos. Of course, there are no backings on the very common sew-through buttons, which are shown on the right side here. Buttons come in a wide variety of sizes, depending on what kind of clothing they were made for. They're measured as lines, which is a French unit of measurement with the silent G, of course. We can convert the diameter of buttons that we document in the field, whether metric or standard measurement, and convert them to lines in our artifact tables or the reports as we write them up. Generally, smaller buttons were found on undergarments and shirts with larger buttons found on dresses, coats, and more formal wear. Speaking of formal wear, military buttons are identified at a number of sites in Arizona from the early territorial period through the post-war World War II era. US veterans, proud of their service, kept their uniforms and sometimes just the buttons for many years after service. While unfortunate that these button types are lost, becoming part of the archeological record, they do tell us about the lives of those who occupied the sites we record. Similar to regular issue buttons, military buttons are also made as one piece, two piece and three piece. Button collectors like Alphaeus Albert have written books detailing the chron chronological development of military buttons and their styles from the Revolutionary War through the Cold War. The buttons we find in Arizona are likely to be related to military service from the Mexican-American War up through Vietnam. Before we go on to the next subject, I just want to acknowledge that the photograph on the lower left corner of the slide here is the grandmother of a coworker of mine, Leslie Rodriguez. I just had to include that picture because it's something to be proud of. I honestly don't have a feel for how important personal hygiene was to settlers and homesteaders in the early to late 19th century. My guess is most people weren't terribly concerned until the turn of the 20th century. Without fast food, soda, and the other garbage that we love today, I'm sure they didn't require regular dental visits and maintenance. I suppose by using cocaine drops to alleviate tooth pain, 
people just didn't care after a while. Nonetheless, there was sufficient demand for the development of bone and hair bristle brushes in the Arizona territory that they are fairly common, especially in urban areas. Barbara Maddock wrote her thesis on bone toothbrushes, which also became a popular book. This book provides a very detailed summary of the toothbrush industry, as well as typologies of body and bristle styles. I had no idea you can come up with typologies of toothbrushes, but that's the incredible thing of historical artifacts, useful material things. Bone was the primary material used to make toothbrushes until after World War I, by which time synthetics like celluloid and bakelite were becoming more common. Animal hair was the primary bristle until the 1930s when nylon was used. When you consider the wear and tear of animal hair on the teeth, brushes just didn't last very long and they were discarded in large quantities, the toothbrushes that is, with no bristles whatsoever. By 1940, most brushes were made in some form of plastic with nylon bristles rather than animal hair. I don't think I need to go into detail on coins since we all know how to date them. Oftentimes, however, coins will be heavily corroded or covered in grime. So whatever you can recognize on, the, on these types of coins, like the front and back images, you can probably search them online for some good information as to at least get a range of manufacturer when these were made. Just remember that the date on the coin doesn't mean terribly much when found on the ground surface as it could have been dropped by anybody well after the site was abandoned. I can imagine if any of us were to look in our pockets or purses, even this evening, you'd probably find a number of coins that are decades old. State tax tokens are an interesting subject. Sales tax tokens were manufactured by states and in some cases, even by cities and businesses between the 1930s and 1960s to smooth the process of paying required taxes on every good sold for both the merchant and the client. It seems that with the generally low taxes of this period, yeah, that was a long time ago, in conjunction with low priced items like candy, sodas, and other five to 10 cent items, there were instances where taxes did not apply for purchases. But even in the Great Depression, it seems, the feds in the state needed to collect taxes and merchants were compelled to find a means of doing so. So they came up with the concept of tax tokens to supplement the small taxes that you couldn't pay with just a single penny. These taxes did add up, I guess, for the merchants over time. So people were able to buy a quantity of these sales tax tokens from the business and then use them as needed uh, for small purchases. Arizona manufactured tax tokens between 1937 and 1954, by which time they were no longer used. Of course, today, as you know, where a candy bar costs almost $2 and your plastic debit card and smartphone scanning is the rage, these tokens just don't matter that much. Other popular tokens in Arizona and other Western states were trade tokens. In the territorial era in particular, money and coins were likely scarce and not easily accessible. Consequently, trade stores, saloons, and shall we say other establishments offered tokens for potential customers, much like gift cards are issued today. Collectors have identified tokens from Arizona towns like Ash Fork and Bisbee, Charleston, which is a ghost town now, Copper City, another ghost town, Pioneer, Pinal, Prescott, you name it. We've got tokens from quite a few places here in Arizona. Still one other token that appeared in the 20th century was for fare on street railways and public transit. These tokens shown at the bottom of the slide here uh, were used to pay fare on, on, the, on, the straight, on the railways and the buses in Phoenix, Tucson, and Bisbee. Uh, in the limited amount of time I've used to find other tokens, I've, I've only found tokens from these three cities. 
Now it's true, we're not likely to find too many of these tokens when we're on an archeological survey, especially in the rural areas. We're more likely to find these types of uh, artifacts on urban parcels when we're doing data recovery and excavation. Portable batteries, the kind we use in all aspects of our lives today, were first developed in the last decade of the 19th century. The makers, or the future makers of Ever Ready, were in business by the 1890s. They were called uh, the National Carbon Company, which was coincident with the timing of the invention of the flashlight, or the torch, as it was known. Early batteries developed before 1920 were the D, the AA, and the AAA. Although it's important to note, they weren't known at this time by their sizes. That didn't happen until the 1920s when the battery companies and the federal government agreed on standards for battery sizes, including A, B, C, D, and an older traditional type, simply known as number six. <laughs> Although our AA and AAA batteries, as I just noted here, and you can see on the slide, were invented as early as 1907 and 1911, they weren't known by that term, AA and AAA, until they had been standardized well after World War II. B batteries and the elusive number six battery were once common, but are now rarely seen, but in maybe in some areas of Europe, and specialty battery stores. Now, of course, considering that batteries are made with a steel casing, we're not likely to find whole batteries on archeological sites when we're on a survey. Uh, the elements erosion over time, have just eaten these away. Rather, we're more likely to find the carbon rods, which were located in the central portion of the battery, as you can see on the lower part of the slide here. These carbon rods are actually quite common on, on many sites. We do find some batteries in relatively good condition when we're on excavation. The one on the lower left here, the image uh, we recovered from an excavation near Lake Pleasant. The label includes a best date label from Ever Ready with a date of October 1941. So that would indicate that the battery that we recovered was made within just a few years in 1941. On the subject of toys, marbles were enjoyed by children and adults as early as the 17th century. Most of the marbles prior to about 1900 were actually made in Europe and mass produced for import and export. These early marbles were made from a variety of clays like porcelain, stoneware, and earthenware, as well as stone like marble and limestone and a variety of agates. Germany was certainly the largest exporter of marbles in the 19th century, producing millions, many of which were shipped to America. That is until World War I, after which the United States took over. That being said, there were makers here in the United States prior to World War I. In the late 19th century, an individual named S.C. Dyke devised a machine to mass produce clay marbles that became known as commies, which is a slang term for common. Though not as well made as the German glass marble or even the German clay marbles, they were more affordable and popular across the country. Glass was used to produce marbles from as early as 1840 and made in similar manner as glass beads by stretching pliable canes of glass and shaping the marbles individually. Germany, again, was the leader in the export or manufacture and export of these glass marbles until World War I. With the successful development of machines to mass produce marbles, it was only a matter of time, however, before companies in the United States improved and increase their production. Production of glass marbles in the United States was initiated about, about 1890, but with the start of World War I, US companies amplified their production, 
and quickly became the world's marble maker through the post-World War II era. There are many collectors who have published books, although I must admit I've not studied marbles intensely. As such, I don't have a good feel for which collectors would be best to follow as far as identification and dating of ceramic and glass marbles. One book I do have on hand is shown here. It's a book on European marble production predating 1900. Marbles were still quite popular when I was a kid in elementary school in the mid to late 1970s. Every, every afternoon uh, for recess, you would see kids lined up along the walls just waiting for competitors to play marbles with them and to challenge them. I would assume and I would imagine, based on my experience at least, that by 1980, Space Invaders, Asteroids, and Pac-Man had changed things considerably as to how we enjoyed ourselves. Dolls were made with a variety of styles, including clay, such as porcelain and bisque, as well as cloth, wood, wax, paper, and cellu celluloid. While early dolls were made immovable, by the mid 19th century, they were being made with turning heads, blinking eyes, and many came jointed, wherein um, porcelain or wood limbs were sewn onto cloth bodies to mimic movement of the doll. These ads shown here are from the 1919 Sears Roebuck catalog and offer a glimpse of the different styles at the time. Many antique dolls were dressed to mimic popular clothing styles of their time and place. My mother, rest her soul, was in the Air Force in the immediate, immediate post-World War II period, stationed in France. She took every opportunity to go on tours and in the process amassed a collection of porcelain dolls from a variety of different countries, each with their own clothing styles and designs reflecting the culture of that area. I'm blessed to be the only sibling who wanted this collection. Of course, everybody knows I'll take anything no matter what. Through the first half of the 20th century, dolls were mass produced with several varieties of plastic. Of course, as I just mentioned, porcelain was also popular in the late historic period as well. It must have been quite a memorable, memorable experience working in a doll factory, factory, oiling the heads, assembling body parts from metal molds, painting faces, and putting eyes into the hollow heads. Who wouldn't want a job like that? There is no denying how dolls shaped the lives of young women and even their siblings. Their looks of innocence and joy gave us all comfort at night, ensuring our dreams were filled with happiness and joy. I'm sure we all have wonderful memories of these delightful toys that seem to follow us everywhere with their eyes. Toy manufacturing took off in the late 19th century with the availability of mail order catalogs. There were more than 500 companies, for instance, by 1900 specializing in toys. A new generation of toys emerged in this period made from any variety of materials. These toys often reflected popular themes, fads, and technological developments of the period. With the advent of electricity, toys began to delve into that field as well. The BB gun was popular from its inception in the 1880s. We all know about the Daisy rifle. And just an FYI, the cowboy on the top there is Johnny West, one of my favorite toys as a kid. I still have that too, by the way. Die-cast cars and trucks were made from the early 20th century, paralleling the cultural and economic phenomenon of the automobile and the airplane. Eventually, these simple all-metal cars evolved to the more colorful and functional cars of Matchbox and Hot Wheels. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you again for attending this evening. Unfortunately, we don't have to 
time to discuss other personal items that we would find on late historical period sites. Uh, some of the items that I left out were smoking pipes, paper products, glass beads, which is an all-day conference in itself, other jewelry, cameras. These are just a few personal items. But with this digital age, there are a number of reliable and trustworthy sites that we can access to glean information about these items and artifacts. Um, I want to thank you again for coming this evening. Uh, I greatly appreciate it and enjoy sharing this information. So Tom, um, I just will give folks, uh, we've, Mary Ellen's been posting Messages asking folks if they have any questions, and so far we have none. Um, so uh, I will appeal one more time. Does anyone have questions they'd like um, Tom to answer? You certainly provided a lot of really good information, so um, folks may be a little overwhelmed. Ah, uh, one question came in. I missed the date for wire nails. Start date? Question mark. Start date? About 1850. They became very popular in the United States by 1890. In fact, they essentially took over the industry by about 1890. So the long answer to that question is you're not going to be able to find too much of a start date. I would I would put circa 1850 and then end with the historic period, which is 1972. So that's what I would use. And, and then we have a very good comment that says, uh, I enjoy your dry humor. Tom, it actually says to him, but Tom. <laughs> yeah, I search and, long. Uh, I search far and wide for creepy dolls. <laughs> My sister had a three foot tall nun doll when she was a kid, and I can't tell you how many nightmares nightmares I had with that nun staring at me in my dreams. It was it was very <laughs> creepy. 